all scripture will be coming from the NIV or the King James Version. I will indicate to you those coming from the NIV. And if I don't say NIV, then it comes from King James. You should be prepared to write down these scriptures. And when you get home and during the week, peruse them so that they might sink into your hearing and your learning. I want you to write down the chapter and verse as I give them. Then next week, I want you to open up your Bibles and look them up. If any verse is not clear to you, you might bring it to Bible study either next Tuesday or Wednesday night and ask myself or Reverend Fenton to explain that scripture to you. A common objective uh, to tithing is that it is bringing in the law. Some say we are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6 and 14. Therefore, tithing is out insofar as Christians are concerned. And yet those who take this particular line often state their view like this. Tithing is only the beginning, and we as Christians should never give more than others. Then, on the opposite side of that, some Christians say tithing is just the beginning, and we really don't give enough when we give the tenth. We need to give more than that. Uh, some people can be very vocal, insisted that any mention of tithing <coughs> as such is legalistic, meaning it comes from the law. They feel that Christians should go beyond the tithe. They don't feel people should be restricted by tithing because tithing puts a ceiling on our giving. Any giving beyond the tenth is considered an offering. As a matter of fact, before if you haven't given your tithe, you really can't give an offering. Offering comes after your tithes have been paid. It's important that you uh, remember that. You might notice in New Shiloh, when the time comes for giving in our order of service, we ask for the deacons to come up and lift our tithes and offering. There is a difference. And I have some reason to believe that many who object to tithing on theological grounds do so to camouflage their own practice. When I have been close enough to a person who takes this line, I sometimes have the impertinence to ask, is your actual <laughs> giving at the end of the year truly equal to or beyond 10% of your income? We usually rub their chin or scratch their head or look down at the floor and admit in the end that they themselves give less than the 10. On the other hand, I know quite a few people who give more than the tenth right in this church. There are some who object to tithing on the basis of legalism, who put it like this, we should only give as we feel led to. Their verse is often Galatians 5.18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. When I hear of people who give only as they feel led, I think of the popular hymn, Every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I'll pray. I only ask, what if you don't feel led to pray? Does it mean you should not pray? I pray every night before retiring and every morning when I rise. And frankly, my own praying is not because I feel particularly led to pray, but I call on God whether I feel like it or not. Surely this is partly what Paul meant by the instant in season and out of season, 2 Timothy 4 and 2. It is likewise stated by some that if you are tithing, you are not giving cheerfully. This is, of course, a reference to Paul's word in 2 Corinthians 9 and 7, that each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the cheerful giver. Yes. Do people who take this line think that Paul will want you to bring the amount of your giving to a level low enough for you to give cheerfully? The same would apply to the amount of time spent in prayer. The cheerfulness in giving should apply to the cheerfulness in prayer. And yet sometimes I do not feel cheerful when I pray. Does this mean I should not pray? 
So when bills are pressing, should I abandon tithing for the moment because I cannot feel cheerful because I got bills to pay? The same principles apply to the command, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5 and 25. All you ladies write this down. Ephesians 5 and 25. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Because sometimes we, I'm talking about the men, we don't feel love toward our spouse as a spontaneous emotion, but we love them nevertheless. We love by showing, by doing, not feeling, but by doing. Amen. This is the theme that runs right through the New Testament. There are times we feel a certain emotion, and this may be based on our own mood or temperament, or it may be based on external circumstances. Other times we don't feel the same emotion. As we're giving cheerfully, Paul added, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things and all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Second Corinthians 9 and 8. Why do you suppose Paul added those words? Because he wanted to motivate these Corinthians to give cheerfully. <coughs> Well, giving cheerfully is not what comes very naturally, and it frequently is not the way we are going to feel when a thousand and one needs compete for our paycheck. Sometimes I don't feel like praying, but I know that I should, so I do. Sometimes I don't feel love as an emotion for someone, but I know I must do and act in such a way that he and she knows that God has given me a feeling of love to them. <coughs> The result of doing what I ought to do, whether praying, giving, or deciphering my own feelings so that I can demonstrate love, is that I am so glad I did what I knew I should do. Tithing is no different. One of the most unsatisfactory expressions that have emerged in some quarters is that of a feeling of being led by the Spirit. And yet I say this carefully because I know too well the feeling of being led by the Spirit. I have it happen to me from time to time, but not all the time. In fact, not most of the time. For most of the time, I do not get this feeling. What do I do then? I live by certain principles. These principles require a lot of self-discipline. When I am disciplining myself, I do not feel led to do this or that or not to do this or that but I act if it were totally in my own strength. Right. And yet this very self-discipline is possible because of the hidden work of the Spirit which resides inside of me. The Holy Spirit secretly lies behind my power of will, although I may not be conscious of the Spirit. But it is the Spirit nonetheless that enables me and you to do what you do. The mistake some of us make is to wait for the feeling Moreover, it is when I'm living by principles of self-discipline that I really am pleasing to God, perhaps more so than when I am being led by the feeling of the Holy Spirit. For I please God by faith alone, right. not by feeling. Right. There is perhaps no greater confusion among Christians than in their understanding of the place of the law in the purpose of God. Do not expect a very learned or complete treatment of the purpose and place of the law in the sermon, Otherwise, we'll be here the next Tuesday morning. But an outline is in order. While I am up here, I hope enough will be said to achieve two things. One, to heighten your own assurance of salvation. And two, to heighten your sense of discipline. If both should happen, an emancipation breakthrough will have been achieved. And this will be a matter of no small consequence. What did Paul mean by these two remarkable statements? Ye are not under the law, but grace, Romans 6, 14. And if ye be led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law, Galatians 5, 18. In both statements, Paul means freedom from the law of Moses. The context of both verses confirm this. But the question is, does the absence of the Mosaic law under the new covenant means no law under the new covenant? Did not Paul speak of being under Christ's law in 1 Corinthians 9 
and 21 in the NIV. Did not Paul speak of fulfilling the law of Christ in Galatians 6 and 2? Did not James speak of the Christian obligation to the royal law of Scripture in James 2 and 8? These three verses point to the law of Christ's kingdom. The word law is a translation of the Greek word nomos, which in turn comes from the verb nemo, which means to allot, and has the sense of what is proper, what is the proper thing to do. In ancient times, it came to embrace any kind of existing or accepted custom, usage, or tradition. For example, is it the norm in the United States to drive on the right side of the road? But it is not the norm when driving in Jamaica, France, England, or most of Europe. So what's normal depends on where you are and the time you're living in and the customs of that time. The law of Moses has been understood as having three aspects. The moral law, which is the Ten Commandments, the ceremonial law, which is a regulation of worship, and the civil law, how people should govern themselves. The Mosaic law was enforced through fear and punishment, as we shall see. The law of Christ is what is proper to his kingdom, namely, his rule in the lives of the people of God, and it is summed up in what we properly call the golden rule. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. And Jesus said this sums up the law uh, and the prophets. And although it's called a new commandment in John 13 and 34, it's nothing more than the summation of the spirit of Moses' law. Jesus called it loving one another as he himself loved us. Amen. John 15 and 12. It is the way every Christian should strive to live. When the Pharisees questioned Jesus as to whether he was greater than Abraham, Jesus replied, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham, I am. So the law of Christ is higher than that of Moses. It sets a higher standard of righteousness. It presupposes a different kind of motivation and is most certainly harder to keep. It requires a motivation and discipline Moses' law knew nothing about. Freedom from the law of Moses is precisely what prepares one for taking on the yoke of Jesus' lordship. Take my yoke upon you, he said, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 29 and 30. His commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 5 and 3, NIV. And yet to keep them is to demonstrate the very righteousness of the law wanted to achieve, Romans 8 and 34. Many seem to think that the absence of the law under the new covenant, and when I say the new covenant, I mean the New Testament, many seem to think that the absence of the law under the new covenant means the absence of self-discipline. And yet the truth is, it is not until we realize that we are emancipated from the law of Moses that the gospel of Christ gives true freedom for self-discipline. Okay? Under the law of Moses, there was no such thing as freedom of self-discipline. It was a case of do or else. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things which are written in the books of the law to do them. Galatians 3 and 10. The law produced the result in one way, through fear, through the fear of punishment. There was an added promise of blessings upon obedience, yet even this was motivated by sheer fear. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 11, 26 and 28. 
But under the new covenant, the new testament, the gospel of Christ, we have this freedom of self-discipline precisely because of our faith, not obedience, counts for righteousness. Our faith counts for righteousness. You'll find that in Romans 4, 3 to 5. In other words, when I know I am saved by grace and not by works, I will need great discipline indeed to obey any of the commandments of Christ. For I realize I am saved in the end, even if I fail to do all that I should, including tithing. I know the New Testament requires transparent holiness of heart and life, and I love everyone that I forgive my enemies, that I bless those who persecute me, that I pray for those who despitefully use me. But when God pronounces me free, then I'm free. My not forgiving my enemies holds no great consequence insofar as knowing the joy of the Lord. Romans 4 and 17. And the kingdom of God. Matthew 6 and 15. But nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. John 8 and 36. You see, the gospel is not a condition. It's not a do or else. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ saves. Therefore, precisely because I am free from the law and because my failure to keep Christ's commandments does not invalidate my salvation, it requires great self-discipline. You might say, I'm saved, so why should I follow anything? I can't be unsaved. That requires this discipline that I'm talking about because you need to do the right thing right. simply because it's the right, right thing, thing to do. Man. Not that someone's holding a hammer over your head, right. not someone breathing down your shoulder, not someone writes up and says, you will perish if you don't do this. Okay? But Christ has set you free. And that's a great responsibility. Amen. 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 You can go out there and do anything you want to. All right? But it must be reflective of the salvation that God gave you yes. because you belong to Christ. You have accepted his son. Right. All right? It's not as restrictive as the law, but it's more challenging yes. because there's nothing that says you cannot do that. All right? That's why you have to have great self-discipline. You see, if I'm told that my obedience determines whether or not I'm going to heaven, I am not being motivated by love, but by fear. But we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but rather the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8 and 15. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. What is our response to this gospel? Is it love? And yet this love is not necessarily a feeling. I can certainly be that. Some things and sometimes one is so overwhelmed that God should love us so much and trust us so much and grant us so much freedom that there is truly a spontaneous combustion of love. We all probably know that feeling very well. Amen. Amen. I, 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 I felt it and sensed it. As Sister Bryant was uh, singing this morning, she was overcome by the feeling of love. The Spirit of God certainly was upon her, and it remains upon her. Okay? But love is a motivation. Okay? It is something we do rather than what we feel. It is an act of self-discipline. One has to work at it. It's not easy. To put it another way, sanctification is the response of gratitude. But it does not follow that the response is always spontaneous. It is usually a sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews therefore spoke of the sacrifice of praise, and that doing good and sharing with others must be seen as no less than sacrifices with, with which God is pleased. Look at Hebrews 13, the 15th to the 16th verses. And this is why Paul told Titus 
that those who believe in God should be careful to maintain good works. Titus 3 and 8. But, but why be careful? Because the easiest thing in the world is to lay aside good works because you know you are saved by grace. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, but ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Romans 6 and 12. Paul exhorted like this because we are saved by faith alone, but also because obedience is not inevitable. We need to be reminded again and again to be obedient to the law of Christ. There's an old Methodist hymn that I learned in seminary that goes like this. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, or oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Tithing is no different. We do not always feel like tithing. Amen. Particularly when the pocketbook is a little shallow. Yeah. But we do it. Why? Precisely because we are not under the law, but under grace. Amen. God has put us on our honor. And yet, when I think that God should do so much for me, how can I but honor him? One theologian put it this way, if Jesus Christ be God and die for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. And that's the feeling that we should have. In any case, Tithing did not come in with Moses, nor did it go out when the law was fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ. Tithing has always been in where the gospel is concerned. This gospel was given to